So we're in this, uh, this sermon series. Last week we kind of skipped over it because of, of the way God was leading. But I wanted to get back to this today. We've been talking about uh, some prayers that Paul has prayed. And we're following these prayers, learning better what it means to pray. How to pray. What to pray for. Um, what to expect from prayer. Uh, and, and it's interesting that Paul prayed several different ways as he wrote his epistles or his letters to the church, to the different churches, to Romans, to the Corinthians, to the Ephesians. He prayed in different ways for those particular people. And so we're wanting to learn better how to pray. And today we're learning how to pray to be unified in God's church, how to be one, how to be connected. I can tell you this, that I'm convinced that one of the devil's greatest strategies is to divide us as the church. He loves it when he can bring a, a mess in the middle of a church and divide people in the midst of their body. He loves it. Oh, that's his main attack, I think. One of the things that I know for sure, I never knew before I was a pastor, but I know as a pastor is that the crosshairs he, that he has on my back all the time, he is trying to take me out. He is looking for ways that he can destroy me because if he can destroy me, he can begin to put doubts in your mind. And so let me tell you, I would appreciate your prayers. Prayer, prayer for our pastors, Pastor James, Pastor Isaac, Pastor Doug, Pastor Sheila, all of us who, uh, who serve in that, that uh, pastoral capacity. But also your Sunday school teachers, your, your uh, 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 children's church directors, all those people because they have a target on their back because they're leading other people towards Jesus Christ. And if Satan can take one of them out, he can bring some sort of a, of, um, uh, a, uh, a mistrust that people will already have in their hearts and minds and he just wants to give them ammunition to back that up. And he'll do that every single time. You know, God himself even knows, of course, uh, what, uh, what it means to, uh, to bring in division. There's sometimes a division has to happen. If you remember the story of Noah and the ark, of course, after the, uh, the ark came to rest and uh, the rainbow and all the things that God showed to them and he, he told them, he said, I want you to go over the face of the earth and what? To repopulate it, to take over the whole earth. Well, a little problem happened back in Genesis chapter 11 and it happened with a guy by the name of Nimrod. Nimrod was a, was a tremendous... Uh, hunter and a powerful warrior and so he, he called the, uh, the people all together in the plain of Shinar which is the place today we call Iraq and he began to build a city, a walled city so that when other tribes, other peoples would attack there would be protection and so everybody started coming there and then they said you know what we're, we're pretty strong here we're pretty powerful let's build a tower and let's build it up into the heavens so we can make a name for ourselves. Let me, let me read that scripture. I think it's up here. It, it says, Come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered all over, excuse me, scattered over the face of the whole earth. Jumping down to verse 6 then, the Lord said, if, if as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then, there, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. And so what did he do? He confused their language. And so we know it as the Tower of Babel. That's where we get Babylon. That's where, that's where the, the city of Babylon is in, in Iraq. And, and that's where all this took place. And he realized when he confused their language that it, it caused disunity. People couldn't communicate. So they had to disperse and go all over the, the, the face of the earth like he wanted them to do in the very beginning. God knows what it means when we are divided. Because when we're divided, we're weak and we are ineffective. So let me tell you something. If, if you know someone who's a Christian and say, well, you don't need to go to church, tell them that, then the, the only problem with that is, is as a Christian, you will be weak 
and you will be ineffective because you don't have the root system, you don't have the, the strength to be able to stand up by yourself as a Christian. You have to attach yourself to the body of Christ. And so not only is it their job to be attached or to, to uh, be connected to a church body, but it is also our job for those people who can't attach themselves in one way or another, if they're in a nursing home or if they're in a hospital or whatever, they've got to be attached by our relationship with them. They're a part because they're a part of us and they're all important. Folks, when building bridges come, we're going to be doing some things for the nursing home. I think last week it was they made some cards of encouragement for the people in the nursing home. The, the days uh, ahead are coming when we're going to make sure that those people know that they're a part of us and we pray for them and we love them. So it's important that we do these things. It's important that we stand unified. I can also tell you this, that uh, we can be... Um, we can be not unified as the body of Christ, as the whole body of Christ. Folks, we're just a smaller uh, microcosm of, of the body of Christ. We're, this is just one part of the body of Christ. Every church in this town who believes in the word of Jesus Christ, who believes in the blood and the mercy and the grace and salvation, all those people that follow by these things, they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. They are part of our body of Christ. And so we're not in competition with anybody. We're not in competition with, uh, with other churches, not the church on 224 or the church on, on Main Street and the church on Willard West. We're not in competition with those churches. In fact, we need to pray for them and pray for their pastors and pray for their ministries because they're touching people that we can't touch. They're in people's lives that we'll never be in. So we need to uplift them and lift them up in prayer. Folks, we stand together as the body of Christ. And we will not be disunified, but we will stand together. So they're not our enemies. Those other churches, those other denominations, I don't care what style of worship they got. I don't care what they wear to church or what they don't wear to church. As long as they're following God's word and, 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 and listening to good preaching and, and doing what God wants them to do, then praise the Lord. Let's back them up. Let's, let's praise God with them and pray for them. I can tell you that, that disunity kills churches. I've seen it in this town. I've, I've watched churches just disintegrate because something happened. A, a leader fell. Something went haywire. And we've, over the 14 years that we've been here, we've seen and been the recipient of churches who blew up. And their, church, their, their people have come here and maybe been here for a short amount of time or whatever, but they were hurt and they were, they were struggling, those people, because of the things that took place in their church. It stunned their Christian growth because of the disunity and because of the, uh, the things that happened in some of the churches. So our common enemy is not other churches. Our common enemy is, is the devil himself who's trying to steal everything that he can from a good God who loves people so much. And he can't stand it that God loves people so much and so he hates them even more. You want to know why you have trouble in this world? We read it this morning. We will have trouble in this world. You might as well figure on it. And especially if you put the name Christian in your name. If you say you're going to be a Christian, you're going to have problems. You're going to have trouble. Life will not be smooth. Do not expect it. You will get sick. You will have problems. You will struggle. Isn't that a Man, pastor, just keep on encouraging us. We just love that. Folks, it's, it's what God said will happen because, because the world hates God. And if we follow God, the world hates us. Let's, let's look a little further. Why do we pray for unity? Let's, let's look at number one. We pray for unity because we desperately need each other. Folks, you and I can't attack this whole town. Me and all you and your time and my time and all the stuff that God has planned, we can't attack every person in this town. We can't, we can't bring everybody in. It just isn't going to work that way. 
So we need the people around us. We need the churches around us to do what God calls them to do because we don't want to see anybody left out. We want to see everybody come to know Christ. Romans uh, 12.5, this is the, uh, the prayer that, that uh, Paul prayed for the Roman church. <clears throat> but as I read it, you'll see that he's really praying for all churches, all Christians. Romans, uh, and why do I have 12.5 and it says 4 up there? Okay, well, let's go to 12.4. Uh, <laughs> Romans chapter 12. I, did, I, I wrote this sermon like two weeks ago, so I'm really trying to remember what it's all about, okay? Just give me a minute. It says, Just as our bodies have many parts, and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. I, I ran across this little quote. It, said, it says this, uh, Unity is not uniformity. All the churches do not look the same. We don't all act the same. And, and I know there are churches out there going, Amen, I'm glad we don't have their pastor. They're saying that about me, by the way, if you don't know that. Uh, it's, it's okay to laugh. It's all right. It's, I know. Um, because I, I can tell you this, that you know, there are people that, that look at me, and, and pastors that look at me and go, You don't wear a suit on Sunday morning? No. And we don't handle snakes, and we don't... Anybody ever been to a snake handling church? Be honest, anybody? Sharon, you been to a snake handling church? That's, that's what's wrong with you? Oh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> What'd you say? It was here in Willard, and they had snakes? Eddie, you know anything about this? Oh, okay. All right. Whew, man, okay. Uh... Yeah, anyway, churches are supposed to be different. What? We had some women in this church that were snake handling. See, I knew there was something wrong with the women in this church. I knew. She said there was women in this church that knew something. John, you know something about it too? I just told my Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's quit talking about snakes. I'm getting the willies, okay? They scare me. Um, unity is not uniformity. We're not going to all look alike. We're not going to all have worship service alike. We're not going to do the same programs. We're, not gonna, it, we're just not going to be the same. We're not supposed to be because we're a different part of the body of Christ. We're not supposed to look like anybody else. We're supposed to look like who God wants us to look like. And we praise the Lord for that. You know, here's, here's the thing. When, does it matter what kind of church or what they look like or what they do? Does it really truly matter as long as Jesus Christ is at the center of things? Amen. It, it, folks, because here's, let me tell you, there are people all around the world, and I'm not just talking about the churches in this town, I'm talking about the churches all over the world that follow Jesus Christ. There are people around this world who are losing their heads because they're following Jesus Christ. And there are people who are worrying about whether or not ladies wear dresses to church. God help them. God help them. There are people worried about the music or they're worried about this or they're worried about that. God help them. There are people losing their heads. They're losing their lives. They're drowning them in cages. Yeah, yeah. You better watch how much makeup you got on, lady. That'll keep you out of heaven. See, that's the, the part that we have to be very careful about. That we don't become a legalistic type of, of body that says you, the only way that you can fit here is as if you look like this, you act like this, and you talk like this. That's the only way that you can be here. Because if you're not like us, you don't belong. That's not a church. That's a club. That's a social club. So we need the different churches and we need them in all parts of the world. Why do we need to pray? We need to pray because there's churches all over the world who are being persecuted. We're just now starting that process of persecution. 
Uh, we've, we've had a little bit of, a bit of it uh, several years ago with uh, the decision with Roe versus Wade when, when he said, oh, you Christians don't know anything. Why do we need to, uh, to bow to your desires or your beliefs? We will not. Same thing with same-sex marriage. We're right back at it again. And folks, it's going to get worse. The world is going to turn further and further away from God. And decay will get worse and worse. Boy, I have just got a great sermon today for you people. Just uplifting. And... But I want you to know the truth. Hang on to Jesus Christ with everything you got. Because it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a tough way to go. The second thing is, why do we pray? We pray, for, we pray because the world will see God's love. That is our weapon. The weapon of love. And man, do I like to poke Satan with that every once in a while. Satan, we're not going to hate those people. Just because they're stuck on heroin and they're destroying their family, that doesn't mean we hate them. We feel sorry for them. We love them. Our desire is to see them turn around and, 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 and ch change their life. Romans chapter 15 verse 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, in order to bring praise to God. You know, I struggle with this knowing me. I know me. I live with me. I've lived with me forever since I was a little kid. Okay? I know me. I was not a lovable person. I didn't turn into a lovable teenager. I wasn't a lovable young adult. You wouldn't have liked me. I wouldn't have liked you. We wouldn't have got along, you and me. You weren't my kind of people. I wasn't yours. And so we wouldn't have been friends. But you know what? It says here that Christ accepted me. And he accepted you, no matter who you are. He accepted you. And not only did he accept you, he's telling me that I need to accept you. That's why I can talk to you now. That's why we can be friends. That's why we can have relationship and, 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 and love each other because Christ accepted me. And he's given me the example to accept you. And if that's for me, tell him I'm busy. Um... But we need to bring praise to God by accepting the people around us. Sorry, Russ. <laughs> Figures it'd be Russ to get a call. We accept others as Christ accepts us. We are known for what, you know, here's... here's in my observation of the church today, the people who are not Christians know us for what we're against. They don't know us for who we love or that we love. You know why? Because most people in their life have been preached at instead of loved at. I think I said it last week. You know, how many people who have decided that they're... Uh, they're uh, in love with a person of the same sex are going to listen to me if I yell at them and say, man, God's going to judge you. Man, oh, you're going to end up in hell. How many people are going to listen to me? Is that love language? That's judgment language, isn't it? Is that my job? It's my job to judge sin. It's my job to say, guess what, folks? I, what you're doing is wrong. They may not like to hear that, but it is also my job to do it in a loving way. You know what? God loved me in the midst of my sin and he loves you too. There was a time where I celebrated my sin too. Oh, I celebrated it big time. I thought, ooh-wee, am I having fun. This is the way life was meant to be. I'm going to celebrate having all this fun that I'm having. And it was sinful, and I was celebrating it. You know what the homosexuals are doing? They're celebrating their sinful lifestyle. And they're wanting everybody else to celebrate with them. Oh, rainbow flags, and, and we are the world, and whatever else they do. 
They're no different than you and me. And you know what? God accepted me. I have to accept them, not their sin. Just them, because God loves them. John 13, 35, 34 and 35 says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another. Love one another. He doesn't put anything in there that says, if they, or when they. He says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, and I don't see the word Christian there either. Love one another if they're Christians. You know, before Jesus came, there weren't any Christians. You know that? Before Jesus, there were no Christians. So if he was just supposed to love Christians, he'd have been out of business when he hit the earth. Love one another means love the people around you. Treat them all the same. Respect them all the same. Love one another. The world will know that we are his disciples if we love. We need each other. We talked about that. And because the world needs a picture of what true love is, he's calling us to that. He's calling us to true love. The last one. How am I doing on time? Oh, man, almost. I guess I've stopped there. It's noon. No, nah, I'll keep going. Anybody's got to leave. Just If you have to go to the bathroom, of course you know what to do with that. But hang on just a second. I'm almost finished. We pray. Why we pray for unity? We pray because uh, we can do infinitely more together. In Acts chapter 4, verses 32 through and, and 34, 32 through 34, it says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything that they had. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in, all them, in them all that there were no needy persons among them. It's one of those verses that, that's really hard. We deal with people all the time who are in need. And they call and let you know. They need money for a water bill or for a gas bill or for rent or for this or for that or whatever. To truly help someone, in their mind, they think all I need is more money. But to really, truly help them is to help them to understand that they're responsible for getting that. We'll pray for them. We'll boost them up. We'll lift them up. We'll help them find jobs. We'll help them. We'll, we'll help them. I never turn anybody down for food, never, ever, or clothes. We got so many clothes, we, we just don't know what to do with them. But folks, we don't have all the money just to pay somebody's regular rent bill every month. We just can't support everybody and there's a lot of people that call and they expect that they look at the church like if you don't give me that you must really only love yourself and not me do you see the hard part of our job the hard part of our job is is that Jesus didn't come to pay everybody's rent bill or water bill he didn't come to pay your taxes Jesus came to love. How do you love people when their parents for years bought them off? And every time they tried to, their parents wanted to make them happy, they just bought them a new toy. Or they gave them a new car. Or they gave them this and they gave them that. And all of a sudden the parents are gone. And the only way they know how to love or how to be loved is receive gifts or be taken care of. How do you love people like that? 
You give them support. You pray for them, not just behind their back, but to their face. You ask them if there's a way that you can help them to rework their finances. Is there a way that we can? But you see, all this takes time and energy. We got plenty of time and energy, don't we? Oh no, you know as well as I do, the time and the energy left the room when we said the kids, uh, we, they got all the energy and they got all the time. We don't have the time, we don't have the energy. But we do have God's direction in our life. And he tells us to love and to go and to do and to help. We've been talking about what we're going to do on 10, 10, 10. And folks, these are just some of the areas that we think we might be able to help people to go. What did I call it? 10, 10, 10. 10, 10, 10. Yeah, I'm going. I had a relapse. 10, 10, that, was, that was, what, five years ago? Man, has it been that long? Okay. Building bridges. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, God's calling us to minister to people. He's calling us to, to stick our necks out. You know what happens when you stick your neck out? When you say, I'm a Christian, I can tell you what's happening in other countries. And people say, either you announce, uh, denounce Jesus Christ and accept Allah, or we will take your head off. We don't have it that bad. We can stick our neck out. Somebody may try to destroy what we do. But I can tell you this, I think that God has a bigger plan. God has a better plan. And he's calling us to that. Let me just finish up here. There are people that are sick of hearing about the love of Jesus. They want to see it. But we have to re-educate them as to what love looks like to help them to understand the true love comes in when a person gives of themselves. It's kind of like if there's a, a glass that's empty here representing that person and you're a pitcher over here full of water full of Jesus Christ because as you follow him the vessel gets bigger I'm not talking about in the physical sense but it just gets more and more full and when we become Jesus to other people and we begin to love them we take the, the water that's inside of us and we pour it into them and I can tell you it's not a one time thing it continues that's why we're building a bridge not just not just building a boat. We're building a bridge so that we can cross that bridge frequently to be in those people's lives, to love them and to touch them. I wanted to start us praying in a certain way. And how many of you receive the email every week that talks about the people that are in our church that, are, are, that we need to pray for? And I told you last week, every single person in our church on Monday through, is it through Saturday? Yeah, Monday through Saturday. Uh, that every single person's name is put on a list, broken up through the alphabet, all the way through the week. And we are asking you, when you receive that email, if you receive it, to, to pray for those people on that list. Pray for them by name specifically. So that means every week, every single person who goes to our church, is related to our church, gets prayed for. Let me add something to that. Will you let me do that? on your handout. If you have your handout, you'll see at the bottom. It says on Monday, <clears throat> Monday, let's, let's do this. Let's pray for the bigger church, the bigger love. Let's pray that starvation could be eliminated. Wouldn't that be fantastic if, if everybody in the world got fed? Everybody. Why can't that happen? Do we serve a God that can't do that? No, we just need to pray. We need to be about his business. On Monday, starvation. 
On Tuesday, pray for every person to have drinking water. This is the world church we're praying for, that the, the church would make an, a difference all over the world. Every single person would have fresh drinking water. Wednesday, that poverty would be eradicated. Is that possible under God? Do you really think so? Oh, yeah. God's powerful enough to do that. Let's pray Thursday that everyone that has a medical need will have attention. Can God do that? Okay, what about Friday? All orphans will be under care. Is God a big enough father to be able to handle that? Yeah. Saturday, that everyone who has lived will know about Jesus. Everybody that from here on out is going to know about Jesus. Can that happen? You know what the Bible says? The Bible says before he'll return, before the end come, the, the whole world will hear the message of Christ. So the Bible already tells that, that that's going to take place. And then Sunday, we're just going to praise God. We're going to worship God. We're going to pause and we're going to pray that God would receive every ounce of worship that he deserves. Will you do that for me? I know that you're, this is a holiday weekend and you're, you know, some of you are just coming off the, the, the party and uh, not that kind of party and okay, yeah, you're just, you know, you've been a busy week and, and this is a holiday weekend and everybody's been busy and, and so just, just, just pray this week. Would you pray this week with me? Add it to your regular prayer list. Every day, just pray. Would you stand with me?